Okay, so thank you everyone for coming for, to the much anticipated urban ecology session. Um, we've got a fabulous lineup of speakers for you today, and we're going to kick off with uh, Mark Goddard from the University of Newcastle. Take yeah. it away, Mark. Thank you, Martin. Well, good afternoon, everyone. So um, this afternoon, I've got the pleasure to talk to you about um, an EPSRC uh, interdisciplinary fund, well, EPSRC funded interdisciplinary project um, called Success. It wasn't my acronym. Um, and this stands for Sustainable Urban um, Carbon Capture Engineering Soils for Climate Change. Um, and so I'm the ecologist on this project, and we also have uh, soil scientists, uh, geotechnical engineer, uh, and sustainability scientists. So it's a real mixed bag. Um, so first of all, I thought I'd give a bit of uh, political background. Um, so you, many of you will be aware that at the end of last year, we had the historical um, Paris Agreement, seeks to limit temperature rises from climate change to uh, less than 1.5 degrees C. Um, and in addition to calling people to reduce CO2 emissions, um, this agreement also explicitly states the need to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. So um, that is sequester CO2 that we've already put there. Um, and soils are seen to have a very important role in this. Um, as an example, the UK government um, has joined uh, many others recently to um, support an initiative called the Global 4 Per Mill Initiative, which seeks to increase carbon, uh, um, so soil carbon stocks by 0.4% per year, which is actually quite a lot. Um, and one way that we can do this is to actually encourage or promote the formation of soil carbonates. And, and this is actually an inorganic, long-term, st uh, stable store for carbon. I'll just um, briefly explain how it, how it works. So I'm not a soil scientist, so I'm just going to do this very simply, but essentially it's uh, CO2 from the atmosphere is captured through photosynthesis, pumped into the soil, where it ends up as carbonic acid after going through the roots, where it combines with calcium to form calcium carbonate, which is basically limestone. It's a little bit like uh, coal growing in the soil. Um, and the key thing here is the availability of calcium. Um, and what we found in Newcastle is that brownfield soils are a really important source of calcium for this inorganic carbonate formation. Okay? So uh, the team at Newcastle, this before we started the project, um, measured a rate of 85 tonnes of uh, atmospheric CO2 per hectare per year captured by this site uh, called Science Central, which is in the heart of Newcastle next to the football ground there. And if we scale that up, it means we actually need around 12,000 hectares of urban land to potentially remove a million tonnes of CO2. Okay, so this, there's quite a lot of potential here. And so one question which emerges is, can we actually design or engineer an urban soil to maximise this, this carbonate formation? So what we've been doing on this project, this is a part that's um, run by my colleague Asan. Um, we've got some large scale, these are four by three metre by one metre deep uh, plots. We're looking at how to engineer a soil uh, for carbon capture. So we use two main sources of calcium. The first one is crushed concrete. Um, this is analogous to what you find in brownfield soils. So I should have mentioned actually that the calcium in brownfield soils comes from things like concrete, um, cement, lime, mortar, things like that. So we've got crushed concrete. And the other substrate we're using is a locally quarried rock called dolerite, um, which actually is where Hadrian's Wall is built on top of this called the wind grassland windstone. So this is quarried locally, and as a byproduct of that, you get a lot of crushed fine material, um, which is essentially a waste, and we're using it um, in these plots as well. It has a good, another source of calcium. And this is looking at basically the best mix of these, these different materials uh, to maximise carbon capture. However, of course, carbon capture is only one of a number of important benefits which need to be provided by urban green spaces. They need to be multifunctional. 
So as you're all aware, there's a, suite, a whole suite of other services which we need to provide, including flood mitigation, maybe urban cooling, recreation, and of course, enhancing biodiversity as well. So one question we're answer, asking really is, the, or the first question is, will plants actually grow on these engineered soils? Because these plants are um, you know, really important for the provision of these other services, and of course, they're also the crucial intermediary between the atmosphere and the soil. So the first question is, will they grow, will plants grow? And if they do grow, can we see anything about how well they grow based on their functional characteristics or their <coughs> traits? Um, so what we've done is we've set up um, a fully replicated experiment, again using these two sources of calcium, uh, crushed concrete and dolerite. And we've got 25 different plant species across a range of um, plant functional types, including woody plants, grasses, uh, different her herbs as well. It's a fully replicated experiment, as I said. We've got some controls that have, have um, no plants in, and some with compost, and some without. Um, and encouragingly, so far, so this has now been running for two uh, growing seasons. We've only had about 6.5% of the plants uh, die. So it does seem that, um, and many of them are flourishing. So it does seem that plants will grow on these, on these soils. Okay, so the second question uh, which I'm going to think about is, what about this, this idea of multifunctionality? Okay, so can we um, say anything about the relationship between this inorganic carbon capture, biodiversity, and other ecosystem services? So we've got three main research questions. The first one is, what explains variation both within and between brownfield sites um, in terms of the inorganic carbon capture? Secondly, what's the rate of carbon capture in different places? So I talked about the 85 tonnes uh, from that one site in Newcastle, but we don't know how typical that is. And finally, what are the trade-offs and synergies? You know, can we divert and deliver multifunctional urban green spaces? Okay, so we sampled 21 sites across uh, northeast England. So we're now over here, so it's the other side of the country. Um, 21 sites, mainly in, in Newcastle and Gateshead, but also some down in Teesside, down here. Um, and within each of these sites, um, we placed 10 sampling plots. That gave, gave us a total of 210 <coughs> data points. <coughs> um, and this just shows the variety of sites that we've encountered. So some of them are actually quite nice, quite uh, diverse, um, wetland and wildflowers and so on. Others are not so diverse, just sort of brick rubble. This is a recently demolished curry factory. Um, <laughs> and you can also see some of the logistical difficulties of accessing these sites. So this is my colleague here, he's about seven foot tall, scrambling underneath uh, a fence because the council had lost the key. So, um, <laughs> and this is one of the easier sites because we did have permission for this one. Um, anyway, moving swiftly on, um, <laughs> how did we actually approach this sampling? So we took a, a soil sample, funnily enough, um, quite shallow, mainly because this soil was so hard to, to dig, um, generally about 10, 20 centimetres. Well, we, we measured a whole road of different properties of the soil, chemical properties like the carbon content, the pH, uh, also geotechnical properties, so the soil strength, which is quite important for developers, uh, and also permeability, um, which has important implications for urban flooding. And then we placed a one metre quadrat and carried out your sort of typical vegetation measures, so vegetation cover, plant diversity, and so on. And then of course the scale, uh, scale still, we looked at some other ecosystem services, so floral abundance is an indicator of the aesthetic quality of the site. And we also measured pollinators using these pan traps here. Um, and in addition to these um, plot scale measurements, we've also estimated a number of site scale variables as well. So for example, the suitability of the site for supporting recreational activities, mm -hmm. for growing food or energy crops, um, and also the wider sort of habitat diversity of, uh, of the site as well. Okay, so what did we find? Now, the first thing to say here is that unfortunately we don't have all the results from the soil um, analyses in yet because th this takes a long time. So what I'm gonna talk about here is, is the results from uh, five sites that we sampled last year. Um, but I do think they are indicative of what we're gonna find with the wider data set. So the first thing here on the left, you can see that um, this is on the, we have the amount of um, inorganic carbon here on the y-axis. You find one site which didn't have very much and the others that showed great variation within, within, site, within the site in terms of how much they do um, support. So we see the heterogeneity of brownfield sites coming in there. And the other thing is when you see this strong positive relationship between pH 
um, and inorganic carbon. And this is quite encouraging because it does mean that potentially pH could be a useful proxy for the ability of the site to support carbon formation because these soil analyses are quite time consuming and expensive to run. Okay, now what about multifunctionality? So again, this is um, 50 plots across five sites. This is a plot scale. Um, and I'll just point you towards, um, it's a bit small, but positive relationship here between carbon capture and plant biodiversity, which is a good thing, always good to see uh, synergy there. And also between biodiversity and a number of other ecosystem services. So this is the plot scale. However, when you look at the site scale, you do start to see some trade-offs emerge. But again, this is only a sample size of five. So don't read too much into this, but I still think um, it's important to note that we have particularly here some, some strong trade-offs between carbon capture and the recreational value of the site. So what does this all mean and where, where do we sort of go from here? Well, one thing that we have been doing is to talk to stakeholders, because it's very important to know what people actually prioritise from these sites. You know, we know what we want, um, or do we, even we disagree amongst the team, but um, you know, what do people want? And we, we're going to be using this information to come up with um, stakeholder-derived multifunctionality measures um, according to different management scenarios. So this is a, a similar idea here, which um, one of our collaborators was involved in. This is some work by Eric Allen, um, looking at, again, various different scenarios for how you would manage um, agricultural land. So we're going to be doing a similar thing, except we've actually been talking to real stakeholders. Um, and we're, I've, we've got a survey currently online, which I'll flash up at the end as well on that. Um, and secondly, we're interested in, in the soil and plant properties that actually predict or um, deliver multifunctionality at these different scales. Uh, and it does seem that in order to minimise the trade-offs and maximise the synergies, we're going to need to think about delivering multifunctionality at the city scale through sort of holistic urban planning, whereby you get different sites dedicated to different sort of bundles of services. Okay, so nearly there now. Um, applying all this, we, we've come up with this idea of carbon capture gardens, which has proved quite popular with the general public, and we've um, recently secured some funding to actually create a, a carbon capture garden at the Science Central, right in the heart of Newcastle, um, to show that we can embed this sort of carbon capture function in the heart of a new development, um, as well as delivering all these other benefits as well. It's going to be co-designed with the local community, and these are some of the ideas we're sort of exploring where we might be able to build it into a, a suds, um, into sustainable urban drainage. Um, we've also had a nice idea from a landscape architect to visualise what a tonne of CO2 actually looks like, which turns out to be about the size of a three-storey house, so bigger than this room. Um, and again, we might build in a, sort of a pop-up element into this as well, so if the site does have to be developed or part of the site, we can move on. <coughs> okay, so just to conclude then, to summarise, um, We've shown that carbonation in brownfield soils is a really underappreciated but important way for sequestering atmospheric CO2. Um, our plant experiments suggest that plants will grow well on these engineered soils, which is encouraging. Uh, and our brownfield surveys also do suggest that we will <coughs> um, be able to deliver multifunctionality, but probably through city scale um, strategic uh, urban planning. And finally, we're promoting the idea of carbon capture gardens as a, a nature based solution for the sustainable management of these brownfield sites. Um, so there's a lot of people to acknowledge, um, especially field assistants and local authorities. Um, but I'm going to leave you with this survey. Please do scroll it down. It just takes a couple of minutes to complete, and we re really need your help with that. So thank you very much for coming along. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. So that's bang on time. Uh, so we've got a couple of minutes for questions. Have anyone got any questions? Yes. <coughs> okay, I had some trouble with understanding your your 18 tons of carbon dioxide, which is really quite a lot. Yeah. Yeah. 85. Yes. Yeah. 85. Yeah. Particularly because <coughs> surely the calcium in the soil is already in a form of calcium carbonate. <coughs> so, so I don't know whether it can take more carbon. <coughs> yeah, well, it's in the No, it's, so it, this is actually what we're able to show through using carbon isotopes. It's not the part of what I do, that actually if there is new carbon dioxide being combined with calcium to form calcium carbonate, which, which is of atmospheric origin. But, the old, but some of them are some of the other already there carbon dioxide must be I'm not sure, but we'll have, we'll have to maybe talk about this afterwards. I'm not sure of the, exactly the details, but so thanks for the question. Thanks. Okay, so 
One more quick question. Mark, is there, yeah. a, is there a trade off with soil organic carbon storage? Interesting. So there's more of that in acid soil. Yeah, well, we have, we have measured that. Um, and the answer I can't, I can't remember, but I don't, I don't think so. I mean, in some cases, I think yes. But you do find that in um, where you have a lot of organic matter, um, you tend to have less organic matter because you, know, you get dominant um, sort of weedy type grasses growing and things like that. So um, it's something we will explore. We have got the data on that as well. Yeah, thanks again. Okay, brilliant. So thanks yeah, again, Mark, thanks. for the presentation. Uh, and then next up, <coughs> if I can make it work, which I can't. There we go. And next up, we have um, Francis. He's going to from the University of Southampton. Hi, I'm a master's student, although looking for PhD opportunities, <laughs> and this was, <laughs> uh, this was part of my third year undergraduate project with another student, Chloe Fulford, and our supervisor, Supervisor Judith Locke. We, um, we wanted to investigate the effect of anthrop anthropogenic sensory pollutants, light and noise, and environmental factors on an urban population of European robins. Next to climate change, urbanisation is the biggest threat to global biodiversity. As human activities continue to encroach upon natural habitat, research into the impact of anthropogenic disturbance on urban strongholds of wildlife is becoming increasingly important for modern-day conservation efforts. Urbanisation introduces anthropogenic stimuli into the environment, which causes a near ubiquitous and evolutionarily unprecedented increase in levels of artificial light at night and levels of ambient sound noise ambient sound, which then penetrate urban habitats and completely interfere with all levels of biolog biological organisation from the cell to the ecosystem, especially interrupting species-specific perceptions of time cues, habitat features and visual signals. Artificial light disrupts sleep and uh, decreases melatonin expression, just desynchronising the endogenous circadian rhythm in organisms. This can have many downstream consequences. Uh, for example, studies have demonstrated advances in the timing of dawn song reproduction, molt, and foraging in songbirds, which in turn can have loads of uh, energetic and reproductive costs involved with this. For example, um, not for example, uh, <laughs> in particular, magnetoreception capabilities to do with migratory orientation in robins works via UV light sensors in the eye that relay cues and other information to drive underlying processes. However, studies have shown that this mechanism can, disrupt, can be disrupted by artificial light. Migratory birds really carefully balance their energy stores with how far and in what conditions they migrate. And so if artificial lighting were to be having these disorientating effects on the birds, this, is, this would have really serious fitness implications. That road noise has been found to decrease the diversity of songs and songbirds, which singing is a really energetically expensive behaviour with the additional cost of reduced predator vigilance and foraging time is an honest signal of an individual's condition. And so females may find males with altered souls less attractive, incurring negative fitness implications for those males. Studies have also found that uh, birds may sing more loudly in response to tra road traffic noise which would incur a negative effect on their fitness due to the energetic cost that this involves. And so the same way in which natural features like tree cover may confer better territory quality through fitness benefits, for example, um, like more food, more refugia, these anthropogenic factors like in sound pollution may have the potential to predict poor territory quality. The European robin, Erythacus rebecula, it's there's been little research on this species since David Lack's publications in the 1940s and 50s, where he really extensively studied the robin's mating system and ecology through mostly behavioural and observational studies. The robin is known as the UK's favourite bird. It's a common sight in any urban park, and it's just this iconic symbol that anyone can recognise and connect with. This also makes it ideal for urban ecology studies being a common city-dwelling species, and is likely to be affected by these anthropogenic factors. The uh, male robins begin activity earlier relative to sunrise than most other UK passerines, suggesting the species is sensitive to light pollution. Moreover, the robin mating system is monogamy, driven by male-male competition for territories and female choice for male song, as an, in, as an honest condition of the individual's, as honest signal of the individual's condition and of the quality of the territory that he holds. 
So this is likely to be affected by sound pollution. In this system, one would expect the best, the fittest, most competitively able males to hold the best quality territory in a sort of dominant hierarchy. And so what this study aimed to investigate was light and sound pollution in conjunction with natural features, including canopy cover, tree age, and forest stand diversity as determinants of territory quality in robins. This is our study site, Southampton City Common. It's a site of special scientific importance, and it's one of the largest inner city green spaces in, this, in the, the UK. These are all the sample sites that are recognised during this experiment. They were selected in a random stratified manner across different habitat types and varying distances from the main road, this one, and the path, the lit path that goes that way. Only 26 of these were ultimately used in analysis, the ones highlighted in red as these were the only ones where we could find robins. Um, pretty important part of the study. Uh, <laughs> in each territory, we measured light intensity and lux and sound level and decibels, which involved taking both day and nighttime measurements to control for ambient conditions. And it was interesting to note that prior to the study, the street lights in the common had just been changed from the low pressure stadium to the more powerful fluorescent bulbs that emit different wavelengths and more intense light. In each territory, we also measured percentage canopy cover, number of tree genera, and type of tree genera present, and circumference of breast height to estimate tree age. And finally, to determine the dominance hierarchy, we employed a taxidermy robin decoy and a recording of a robin song in this setup to entice an intruder response in the uh, wild robins. And yes, some of them were really aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> and so we did this in August and September of last year as this is when the male robins had just returned from migration and completed molting. So this is when they're most active in competing for territories. Focal continuous recording allowed us to record both duration and frequency of um, visual and vocal display and latency to exit after the decoy was removed. Since the most aggressive robin would be expected to be the most competitively able and therefore the highest in the dominance hierarchy, we were able to employ behavioral aggression as a proxy for the dominant hierarchy and to assign individual ranks where we used rank one as the lowest, uh, least competitively able, least aggressive male and rank 26 was the highest. Mm. And so we investigated <coughs> different aspects of the behavioral response but ultimately we found that total duration of aggressive behavior, so the proportion of time spent overall uh, both visually and vocally displaying, was uh, explained the greatest amount of spatial variation in the behavioural response with the distance from the road. So ultimately we use this in order to, to base, uh, as a basis for constructing the dominance hierarchy. In order to simplify the many biotic and abiotic factors we measured and wish to consider, we carried out a principal components analysis. This produced seven components, of which the first two accounted for 50% of the variation in the factors. On this plot, the shades of blue indica indicate rank, where darker the blue, the lower the rank. So here we can see that rank seems to decrease as principal component one increases and principal, con two, principal component two increases, which we explicitly show in this graph. Both principal components returned as being significant predictors that explained a whopping 49.8% of the variation in the dominance hierarchy. These are the factors and their associated eigenvectors that contributed to each of these components. And what all those results actually tell us was that um, nighttime lighting and daytime noise were really important negative determinants of robin territory quality, with more nighttime lighting and more noise during the day making for worse quality territory. At the same time, we found that daytime lighting and nighttime noise, as the flip side of these factors, were positive determinants. There was little, if any, noise at night recorded, which made for better quality territories. And daytime light was a similar measure to canopy cover with a correlation between these two factors. And canopy cover was found to be a negative determinant of territory quality, which may be because in a more open <coughs> habitat, the robins are able to display and sing much more clearly in to the other robins. <coughs> and in a similar manner, having greater tree diversity may also contribute to this, which is also a negative determinant of territory quality, as this may, with m having more different genera of trees, this may be greater layering in the forest structure. And finally, we found that tree age was also a positive determinant of robin territory quality with an older forest stand making for better quality territories. And so visually represented, we can see there is this nice kind of pattern where rank increases as we move away from this road and this path. 
And so here we show that proximity to artificial light at night and greater daytime road noise results in lower quality robber territories. Since we use the uh, dominant hierarchy and the territory quality as the response in this experiment, we show that not just natural selection, but sexual selection as well may be affected by these factors. We also show that tree age and canopy openness may be positive predictors of robin territory quality. But it's important to remember that this is a very dynamic system, that the boundaries of robin territories are in constant spatial and temporal flux as pair bonds form and individuals choose to migrate or remain resident. And so the factors we show here may just be the factors that are important at the time of this study. But the fact that the anthropogenic factors like noise had an effect on the dominant hierarchy at all indicate that these factors play a role in the robin's mating system, that they're factors the robins respond to and to a degree are adapted to live with. And so what the study really highlights is that these anthropogenic factors may, can be just as important as the environmental ones in determining territory quality in an urban landscape. And so both biotic and abiotic factors need to be considered to fully understand what makes a territory good or bad in an urban habitat, which may be something that's been missing in urban ecology to date. And so further study into how other covariate anthropogenic factors may have hit robins or other taxa would broaden our understanding of the impacts of urban living on our wildlife. But what this study really paves the way for is research into exactly what the fitness implications of light and sound pollution may be for, uh, may be for the robins of these, of these factors. And so in the future, we may hope to study perhaps survival or number of offspring in robins that live under these conditions. What's more, there may even be tran transgenerational effects that we could study, for if the parents are stressed, this could translate into knock-on effects on the offspring. And so to take these findings further, we might begin to appreciate potential mitigation strategies into, against light and sound pollution. For, um, especially since light and sound pollution are continuing to increase with more people in traffic on the roads. And especially as there's evidence in the literature that particularly longer wavelength and more intense light can have more severe, dis severe disorientating effects on the robin's magnetoreception capabilities. And so changing lighting plans to reduce photon radiance, photon scatter, and to reduce intensity, uh, minimizing um, speed limits and traffic density on adjacent roads, and perhaps even directing more major roads away from urban green spaces maybe positive steps towards, in future development plans, maybe positive steps towards protecting urban strongholds of wildlife. And so in the light of this study, I'd hope we could start to see perhaps the importance of addressing not only environmental management, but the impact of anthropogenic stimuli and the conservation of urban habitats. Thank you for listening. Thank you. It's really fascinating talk again. So, have we got any questions for Francis? We have time for two or three, perhaps. Were noise and light spatially correlated in your study design? No, because there was lighting. The the majority of the lighting that had an influence on the common was along that path, the path that ran south and uh, east west. Whereas most of the the noise that affected it came from the road that ran north south. So, they were quite kind of. Not completely independent of each other, but it was pretty pretty decent setup. Any other questions? <coughs> well, the, the phenomenon of acclimation. So, people, humans that live by railway lines, um, after a bit, or in the flight paths of aircraft, after a bit, they hardly notice these effects. Robins must be the same. To an extent, I mean, as you saw, it could be something that they're adapted to live to live with. But I think the fact that there are partially migrating species means that there'll be robins that aren't there all year round. So they'll come back and they'll be experiencing different environments eight months of the year, and then they'll have to come back to this, and this is where they're, they're reproducing. And so I feel that acclimation might not happen as quickly. And yeah, I, I think we need more studies into this. There's such little literature on this kind of aspect of urban ecology that it's, it's hard to say. Time for one quick question more, if we have any. Do you think that change to different types of lighting um, can influence the It could 
do. The, the difficulty with doing something like that is it seems to be in the literature that artificial lighting is quite, has quite specific effects on taxa. So if you start thinking about different wavelengths, in the Robins it was that longer wavelengths has, seems to have more severe, severe effects, but in salamanders and reptiles it seemed that it was the other way around and it affected their kind of homing ability for newts to get back to their home pond, for example, after hibernation. It was actually shorter wavelengths that affected that. And the same with bats, it's shorter wave wavelengths that seem to have a more severe effect on them as well. And so it may be better to aim to change lighting plans that firstly emit a narrower spectrum of light and so therefore impacting fewer taxa and changing the lighting plans so maybe they turn off at certain times of day that they're not needed. It's like four in the morning when there's it's not gonna be anyone around. Thank okay. You. Brilliant. Thank you very much again. So next we have Bryony, and she's going to talk, tell us about biodiversity and ecosystem services in urban areas. Take it away. Hi, thanks for that. Um, I'm going to talk to you about some work that I've been doing with a whole lot of other people on um, a multi-institutional consortium project called FUSE, which is part of the NERC funded BESS program, and BESS is about biodiversity and ecosystem service provision in different landscapes. Um, and the FUSE project is focused particularly on urban landscapes and I've forgotten to get the thing. Um, there we go. So the urban landscapes we all know is a heavily modified landscape. So some of that is that we've got, um, replaced a lot of green areas with um, built infrastructure, so we've changed surfaces, but we've also changed the 3D structure of the <coughs> landscape by putting in buildings. And the green areas that we have left are highly fragmented. They're fragmented at large scales, but they're also fragmented at very fine resolutions and they're modified internally through management and change vegetation types. Um, and so what we end up with is a very, um, is a, the landscape has structure at the landscape scale, but um, it's also a very um, complex environment at local scales. And we are interested in our project on how we can best characterize this complex landscape with high spatial turnover in, at small scales. Um, Okay, so yeah, sorry, the BEST program is about particularly looking at this um, in multiple landscapes, <coughs> trying to characterise biodiversity and ecosystem services in and, and multiple landscapes, and um, working out how to do that in urban landscapes is particularly challenging because of this, this complexity. Um, so one way we can look at um, landscape, uh, one way we can try and characterise the landscape is by modelling it using computer models, and this is an example of a, um, a carbon model um, using the INVEST um, ecosystem service modelling program by my colleague Darren Grapius. Um, and, but what we don't know really is how well this really characterises what's going on on the ground in these um, diverse environments. Um, and in the case of carbon, perhaps we, um, these are better parameterised models, but there are a lot of other ecosystem service models that we can build in the same framework that are less well parameterised that we don't know how well they work. Um, one thing that we like to do as ecologists is to go out and survey particularly in green spaces but what we tend to do is survey quite intensively lo in, in, um, spatially, um, sorry, we survey in spatially local areas quite intensively. And we have done this also in our project. I can talk to you about this another time if you like. Um, we're not entirely sure how well this scales up, but one of the important things in an urban landscape is that if we're just focusing particularly on green spaces, is that we're gonna miss all of this other, um, all of the other landscape potential habitats and areas um, in the built environment. So we come back to this question of how we do this. And so something that we've um, tried in our project, we're, we were trying to work out how best to characterise these landscapes. Um, and one of the things we talked about is perhaps we could move through the landscape and sample at a lower intensity, um, but sample continuously. And if we do this, are we able to capture the um, local scale variation of the landscape, but also get a signature of what's going on at the landscape? Can we aggregate the, the results of this sort of um, survey um, to get a signature of at it in different urban forms. Um, and we're interested, because our uh, focus is particularly on biodiversity and ecosystem services, we're interested also in the experience of the um, landscape for pedestrians. And so moving through the landscape like this, um, should, um, will this give us an idea of what, what, what they're experiencing? Um, so all of the work we've been doing in the FUSE project is in this study area um, in Milton Keynes, Luton, Bedford. These are small towns just north of London, 
Um, they're picked because they're um, quite close to each other and they're topographically and climatically similar, but um, they have a wide range of urban development histories um, within all of the towns. So we've got everything from medieval areas right through to very, very modern developments. And so they work as a good study system. Um, what um, we characterised initially in the project across the whole landscape, the whole area was characterised within these 500 by 500 metre areas um, for urban form, and urban form was assessed based on both the built environment and the vegetation features. Um, we then selected a subsample of those areas that can be characterised on the ground um, that represented a range of different urban for form types replicated multiple times and spread across the full towns. And these are the areas that you can see in the red tiles. These are, um, roughly speaking, the areas that we worked in. As I said, roughly, we didn't quite cover all of them. And so we tried to apply this idea of um, moving through the landscape to capture both local and landscape scale experiences. Um, and we, so we wrote, um, walked transect routes that were one kilometre long through each of those um, red tiled squares, and everything from very low urban areas with, with a lot of vegetation through to very highly modified environments on the right, which is the centre of Milton Keynes. We walked 112 of these routes, and they were just along public rights of way. And so the public rights of way, as I mentioned earlier, it was to try and get at this experience of biodiversity and service provision as you move through these complex landscapes. And you can see how much of the urban environment is just a flavour of some of you know, you know how the urban environment changes because you're all pedestrians there. <laughs> um, the <coughs> you've got very different vegetation types and um, built form types. And so uh, this blue is a, your tra a transect again. And that was um, the, the dot. We broke up the transect. I mean, we walked it continuously. We broke it up into sections of 100 metres, which are um, we're considering as sort of, sort of analysis units. So we'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, and we also did some more intensive sampling at a series of points along the transect. So we have both the movement and um, some fixed point samples. It's mostly just for interest. I won't tell you more about that, really. Um, Along these routes, we surveyed both biodiversity and com components of the environment. So um, in terms of biodiversity, we surveyed butterflies using a Pollard walk technique with a five metre wide transect. And along that same transect width, we surveyed trees. And we know that's quite narrow, but we also surveyed more intensively at these um, points along the route. Um, and the trees, we surveyed both for diversity and so that we can take um, um, we'll do ecosystem service assessments based on the tree information we have. Birds were also surveyed. I won't be talking about those today. That was done by the BTO. Um, and so we were able to call on more standard methods for birds and butterfly and tree surveys. But how do you, um, we wanted to also capture the experience of the environment. So we wanted to measure noise, temperature, humidity, particulate matter pollution, um, and we took recordings of the sound and visual environments as well. There aren't really standardised ways of doing this at the moment to move through the environment to, get, to capture these sorts of recordings. So. We gave a lot of thought to how we were going to get the sort of equipment that we wanted going through, being held steady um, for long periods of time. So we put this to Paul Richards, one of our colleagues, and this is what he invented for us. Um, <laughs> so we called this the backpack, other people called it other things. Um, the, and this was um, um, held together the um, uh, bits of recording equipment at the right heights and everything for long periods of time. And Jerome here is holding a sign sorry, I can, saying, sorry I cannot speak, I'm recording surrounding sounds, because as you can imagine, we had to deter a lot of passers-by <laughs> from long conversations. Um, so I have only, we, a lot of the data we've, has taken a long time to bring together, it's just coming together in the last few weeks, but I have some very preliminary, sort of a bit of a flavour of what we've got to look at um, for you today, um, and hopefully more in the next few months. So one of the things that we know we're interested in is whether we can capture both the local and the landscape scale um, experience <coughs> using these methods. And one of the things you might expect from our data to see is a relationship between butterflies and green space, because you hope you might see more butterflies where there's more green space. And so these graphs have got butterfly abundance on the y-axis and a measure of green space, the proportion of vegetation cover estimated at local scales on the left, which is just... Um, uh, by I estimate along the transects um, and at landscape scales here on the right. And at landscape scales, we've aggregated the butterfly data up to um, the just for, for one of these entire tiles I showed you earlier. 
and the green space measure is also at that type. Thing. And so, what broadly speaking, if you kind of look at it on the right angle, you can see a generally positive trend between the abund butterfly abundance and and green space, which is what you would hope to see, what we would expect. But we're seeing it nicely at both scales. This is quite positive. Um, as an example of our um, environmental data, data, which is quite a bit messier, as you can see, we've got an example of noise, and this is um, um, a measure of noise weighted for the human ear. So it's to do with um, it's this is the sort of noise that we will perceive. Um, and Again, if you squint, you can kind of see a generally negative relationship, but we, we have a lot of work to do with these data to make sure that we're accounting for a lot of different things. We want to say that this is where, looking both at the local and the landscape scale scales, to see if we can get a se landscape scale signature of the noise environment, but also whether we can measure at local scales what factors are influencing the um, auditory environment that you're experiencing. So one of the other things is we've said that we're interested in the uh, pedestrian experience. So you can measure the environment all you like, but if there's nobody there to experience it, it's a bit of a tree falling in the woods scenario. So we did actually look also at the number of people who were on the transects at the same time as us. We just did this as a count as we moved through the environment as well. Um, and to give an example with the same things that we were looking at before, butterfly abundance and noise, and were they co-occurring where there were people. Um, and it kind of looks, again preliminarily, like the um, where there's a lot of people that there may actually not be very many butterflies and this um, you might want to jump and say this is just because of where the vegetation where, the, where there are few people where there's more vegetation if you look at our previous graph that actually doesn't seem to be what's going on so like I said we've got a lot more exploration to do but just as a pre preliminary idea um, but what we have um, we have success with what we, can, we want to say though is that the data are, um, we've got we're excited about what we've been able to do with it and we've been able to cover very large areas that we never would have been able to um, survey if we've tried to do the same thing intensively at multiple points. So we have a good range of data. Okay, and so where to from here because obviously we're a, um, still got a bit to go. So one of the things we have is quite, we've, which has just come in through last week is some very high resolution LIDAR data. So we're going to be able to look at the vegetation structure and the area around where we've been working in with in some detail and see how that influences the variables we've been looking at, which we're quite excited about, but that literally just came in, came in last week. Um, we're going to be able to look at these, these core questions of the best programs interested in how biodiversity and ecosystem services co-vary, but also how our measurements of ecosystem services vary when we take those landscape scale computer models compared to what we can um, measure in the field um, using, for example, the tree survey data. Um, and of course, um, as I've been talking about, we can look at the local <coughs> rel um, landscape, relative importance of local landscape scale features. Um, and that's all from me. Thank you very much. Um, there's a lot of people to acknowledge, including the people I had on the um, first slide, which whose names obviously <laughs> slipped off this one. And, um, thank you, and thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Thank you very much. Have we got any questions for Brian? I just thought there's, a, there's an amazing guy in New York called William Helmreich. He's lived every block in New York City as kind of a social geographer. Okay. And he's given like a, a special insight. Do you feel that like kind of same way? Is it like walking the streets and seeing things you wouldn't see normally if you just got spots on the map? Yeah, I think so. I mean, if you do any intensive sampling in the urban environment, things that you'd never see otherwise. Um, but it has it has been an interesting process because you can see you see a lot I see, feel like in some ways you see a lot more similarities in areas that people who live there don't see. But you do you do start to um, yeah it's a it's a different experience. I think it would be a very different thing doing it in New York to doing it in Milton Keynes, the suburbs of Milton Keynes where it's a lot quieter. But um, especially when you're um, thinking a lot about the auditory environment and the do you have any plans to track people's experience as they walk along the same one kilometer um, Yeah, so there's, um, we have all, um, love, we have photos from um, not at all of those points along the route, but um, probably we've got a couple of thousand photos from along the routes, and we have the, um, the recorded data. 
So there is an idea that we'll be able to not take people along the real world, but take them along in an, um, 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 you know, using a computer environment where they put headphones on and everything else. Um, the project's sort of coming to the end and it might, it, we're a bit worried it might stall, but the data's all there and well, there's definitely oh, very much a to do that. And to, so to look at whether, you know, if you match up the visual and the elementary environment, but also whether you switch them around so that they're mismatched and see how people respond. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, so next we have Richard Scott with a box of tricks. With a box of tricks. I'm going to be as fast as I can because um, we'll, we'll refer to them anyway. But, um, um, I'm here to talk from an organisation called Landlife, which was one of the first urban wildlife um, groups in the country, really. Um, and a project called the Tale of Two Cities, and it's really about cultural ecology. And I think if you if you've heard John Rodwell speak recently, he gave a fantastic talk called "The Tyranny of Typologies" last year in um, in Manchester at the Society of Ecological Restoration Conference. And it's really about how we touch base with people and the landscapes, which are part of that link to people. This is one of our oldest projects. Um, Devil's Bit scabies is supposed to be this keynote grassland species. Just about 20 years ago, we sowed 10 grams of seed. If you do the right things and put, put things on the right trajectory, with some of these great urban soils, you can do some wonderful things. Um, our history really comes from, you know, on the edges of towns, from inner city Liverpool to looking at solutions for un unused, neglected lands. I remember when we started this project, which is in the early 90s, there was people saying it was ridiculous because you shouldn't you know, these things shouldn't be in these kinds of places. But they should, and you could, you, you know, you could, there's no reason why you can't deliver cornfield annual um, biodiversity targets in urban areas. And in actual fact, there's exciting ways you can add up the edges and deliver these things in exciting places close to people. This was the um, beginning of us winning uh, the National Wildflower Centre at Millennium Project for Liverpool, and simply because we proved that this was happening. In, uh, in these kind of places. And it was Heather Cooper, who was an astronomer, who saw the value of this, perhaps rather than a, a, a true conservationist in that way. She saw the magic of this um, as a scientist, but not specifically an ecologist. And this is what we've, um, this is at the National Wildlife Centre, about six miles from here, um, building on that as displays and, and capturing people's imagination with what you can do with um, native species, really. We know there's different landscapes. We know there's kind of a real contrast between this. These are all ecologists, by the way, but they were really coming to look at these these um, Iberian irises, in the specially created in these areas. But you know, it's hard for an ecologist even not to marvel at this kind of <laughs> turf. Um, and there's all it's different strokes for different strokes, really. But um, we began on a project funded by Q two years ago where we really wanted to kind of take their money, which was for an England flagship. We were particularly keen to win it because we produced all the seed. If any of you had any grow wild seed, it came from Merseyside, it came from Liverpool, it came from some of those fields you've seen. And we were very proud of that, but we wanted to win the flagship. And we did it by combining Liverpool and Manchester, um, two famously competitive cities, whether you talk about cotton or music. Um, and doing it uh, hopefully in a way that combined the culture of both places and used wildflowers as a platform. These places, this is Everton up the road, um, both Everton and Hume where we were working had gone through enormous transitions of change uh, in terms of the urban landscapes. Some of the most densely populated parts of the city then became, um, people came moved out to places like Kirby and Skelmersdale. And it happened in both Liverpool and Manchester in terms of, this is depicted in a great film by Terence Davis called The Time and the City. It's a great film to see. People's disappointment in the post-war years. After this came the tower blocks. Um, the average mortgage on a tower block was about 70 years. Most of them went in about 20 and were probably still paying for an awful lot. People were let down by the um, planned system. Um, Manchester Hume, same kind of thing. So here we are in Everton Park at the beginning of this project. We had to win the vote. 
We won it by public vote and did it by, um, this was the start of it, by using music, art, creativity, um, initially to win. We got 20,000 votes uh, and won the public voting campaign. And it's, it's a shame we have to go through these X factor type things and be pitted against one another. And we were pitted against Sheffield, who the work, you know, we know those people, we love their work too. Um, it's a shame we get into this way. But anyway, we won, and we wanted to deliver it with style and verve and, and use the connections. And, and we, we, we started by um, Ian Prowse, who's a well-known Liverpool singer, great anthem called Does This Train Stop on Merseyside, if you, if you look that up on YouTube. Um, but we, we, we actually rode the train in part of the vote gathering process between um, Lime Street and Piccadilly. And, and that's part of the story, really. Then we started to build up the momentum once we'd won. We were excited to win. Um, um, this idea of a flagship and what a flagship could be. For us, the idea of a flagship, you know, it's the kind of naval thing, I suppose, in terms of it sending out signals and all that. But we really actually like the idea of landmark a lot better. And if any of you have come across the work of people like Robert McFarlane, for example, um, his work in terms of captivating people's links through language, and that's what we wanted to do with children particularly, um, was very important. And it's reigniting some of the, the, you know, the local stories in both places, capturing people's imagination in as many ways as possible. Seeds really important. Um, seeds of diversity, seeds of hope, you know, all these things have metaphors of seeds, really. Um, links to people like art, people like Andy Warhol, surprisingly, for a lot of people, said land really is the best art. He, d he did really say that. Um, <laughs> and it's making the most of it, you know, how often do e ecology projects not link to people in a meaningful way? And so we, we captured the money but we captured it in such a way that we wanted to create as many areas of wildfires as possible in terms of making a big splash um, but also in terms of how people were conveyed in terms of for example children and young um, particularly um, you know 15 to sort of 25 year olds making music collaborations based around the music between both cities um, the science also, you know, the science is going to be a big drive in the future. We don't make enough. Knowsley, where the National Wildfire Centre is based, um, has some of the lowest attainment levels in mathematics and science. Um, art is very getting rare, sadly, extraordinary. Art in Everton schools is rare. It's very difficult to get children to engage um, in that way. We had artists working with children, producing things like like these ceramic houses which picture, which picture the kind of link between the, the, the past and the future. Um, designs created by children working with screen printing and those kind of things were all really important in building this story. Um, part of the process was the good change um, and part of the process was you know, like organisations like Q. Um, this guy travelled up from, this is Hume in Manchester, because they were worried about this subway area being converted to wildflowers because of somebody got mugged two years ago. And in, in all honesty, they were worried that Q's name might be sullied if the flowers attracted people and people got battered. It didn't happen. Um, the process of change, again, is, is, is about that, it's not just involving people, but the excitement of people being shocked and surprised by the change and the numbers of people we got out was huge you know 1500 children I think in the first um, in the past two years uh, and varied groups you know both in Liverpool and Manchester and also cross curricular sewing so we would sew with a group in Liverpool in the morning and take um, as many people as would come to a, a, a sewing in Manchester and vice versa and then it's the change, you know, like the witness of that change. And of course it is about annuals. And you, s you can say that these are kind of temporary landscapes, but it's what follows. You know, that you start people on that journey, which if you remember the first slide in the Devil's Bit Scabious is about creating special things in the longer term. But how do you get people to ride that journey unless you get involved in this kind of um, awakening really? Um, which is, is a lot easier than people think. It's about 
you know, local authorities, the way um, landscapes are managed. Um, but it's about, you know, this kind of reaction in terms of urban spaces. Again, this is just about three miles up the road, and we did equivalent of 20, um, 20 football pitches between Liverpool and Manchester, so 10 football pitches each. Um, Lem Sisse, I don't know if you know this guy, been on the radio a lot talking about homecoming, became Chancellor of Liverpool University here in Everton overlooking the city on a celebration day. What did he say as a metaphor? I am a wildflower. It's about resilience, it's about who I am. Um, he was a care leaver um, in, in um, had a rough time as a teenager in Wigan, and is, is, is a campaigner for that. And other, other artists and groups um, particularly saw um, this idea of resilience, big theme in ecology, um, in terms of people, and the idea of wildflowers and resilience was, was actually quite one the artists really loved to pick up on. It is about, you know, like, um, obviously the bigger stories of biodiversity coming on board, and we were getting extraordinary counts of, like, bees and things in um, both Princess Parkway in Manchester, where we were doing areas, and in Everton in, in, in Liverpool. And really, this idea of creating landmarks, I think, is important. And, um, you see here the, the, the houses, one of which is at the front, um, was set out on an old street line. This was one of the streets that was demolished, and we did three street lines and, and installed the houses in the streets. This was an artist called Caroline Tattersall from Salford, but the installation was in, in Liverpool. And one of those houses, we, um, because we had links to China, was gifted to a group in China. We were also doing wildflower projects in Chengdu. Chengdu is one of the fastest growing cities in the world. Um, so you can influence um, from visitors who've come um, from Kunming, um, from the National Scene Bank in Kunming, they started to release Chinese wildflower seeds for the first time. You know, this idea of seed banks, just locking seed away for what? Catastrophe, you know? It's about using that seed as a living seed bank too, and they released 54 seeds, species of Chinese wildflowers, and there's an Everton townhouse. Mm -hmm. Princess Parkway in Manchester had been a pretty boring strip in between times and started, this was the first year, with annuals but now evolving into perennial wildflowers which were sown at the same time. Um, subways, this was the famous subway, both pictures that were a real controversy in terms of what had happened. Um, Robert McFarlane, you know, read his books, was really interested in this idea of a landmark where we want to take it, a northern flower house. <laughs> That's where we want to go. Artists like, again, we produce this beach shot on the front of the Albert Dock. Robert McFarlane is working to secure like new languages, new um, lexicons for, for talking about nature and the way people use that language. Municipal, municipal pride in terms of civic leaders. Um, new cartoons in terms of the way people are reacting. So as we finish, um, what is the most inspiring landmark urban ecological experience you have had? You know, I'm sure many of you have touched on it. Artists, writers have wrote about edgelands and things on cities. But if you've got them, please let us know, because these stories are really important. Um, our story is a difficult one. We're coming to the end. Uh, perhaps the National Wildflower Centre might close just because of funding difficulties. But we're looking ways of building this northern flower. Thank you, Richard. Really interesting talk. Have we got any questions? The key partners here were like friends of Everton Park, um, and in Manchester there was a National Trust, um, actually um, Gardner in residence in Manchester City Centre, who was key, um, but also community groups in Hume, like Hume Community Garden. And it was <coughs> about building those relationships together. Originally, Liverpool and Manchester both were thinking about going for the competition as indi individual cities. They wouldn't have won. So it was that thing about cooperation, um, the Chinese thing about, you know, um, 
if the if the spoon's too long, you can't you can't feed yourself. You can feed each other. And we won 120,000 pounds to deliver this project. So it was about, but it was about partnership and collaboration. Collaboration is really underrated and it's seldom done really well. But um, when you start involving artists, it can be really exciting. And scientists and artists together, brilliant. Um, hi, my question was mainly about um, where you chose to have these wildflowers in the first place. Obviously these are aimed to attract communities. Is it was it just a case of which partners you could work with or did you have um, certain ideas of where you wanted to have these? Visibility. I mean the thing is a lot of a lot of times and it's been true for us in the past that you know um, areas are put out of people's view. There's this chasm between ecology and people. So it was really about in people's faces. Everton Park is one of the best viewpoints across the whole city, as you can see. Places like Princess Park in Manchester is driven past by 100,000 people every day, and the parks around there. So it is about, it's the reaction with people, but showing you can do this thing really well in, in really friendly places. Okay, brilliant. Is, um, is Dong here? So is our next speaker here? <laughs> okay, so um, that gives us an extra 15 minutes to ask some more questions of our speakers <laughs> than we've already come, so um, I don't know whether anyone's got any questions for who, who they, they didn't have a chance to ask, ask that they'd like to ask now. Yeah. Some of these areas are all very different. I mean, some of these areas we were, it's, it's, it's about good ground preparation and experience. Um, we know from some of the other few flagships um, that they really struggled in the first year just because they hadn't done it before. So it is about experience. We've produced, um, you know, we've produced good practice guides over our 20 year experience. And it is about making the best opportunities really involved in people like you know, the apprentices and the you know, council departments. Because the idea is to create a legacy. You know, the thing is these projects are not about running away for. So that site you see there is the longer term thing which is now 20 years old. Yeah. But it's how you engage people on that journey. And so the annuals are really important because people see something in 12 weeks. But it's what you sow with the annuals, it's what you do to minimise all the kind of need, you know, like Google problems and having a knife for that really. Um, so part of the story is is taking all that on board um, and doing it really well. And do you think some of the people that got involved were inspired to recreate that in their own kind of way? Yeah, we've had a lot of groups coming, for example, from farther afield. The idea is in England flagship, so there's, but there's been people from all over the world. Groups from Blackpool, you just wanted to copy it in terms of mirror it. Um, and it is how you add up these things together. I think. Um, for us, it is about the danger is when you when you win a project like that, £120,000 sounds a lot. We split it instantly in half and then did all the music. And if you go to the Tele Two City sites, we've got musical tracks. And things. That did take a lot of energy and effort, but it's, it's what people remember. Um, and I think this idea of a cultural ecology. And going back to the John Rodwell thing, is, is, you know, he's a national vegetation architect in his retirement, almost. He's just finished a big pan-European, in his, in his kind of um, more, um, what would we say, liberating years following his academic career, is excited by this cultural story across Europe, and it's special everywhere. So the idea of reuniting two cities was just... I mean, we, we met people we've never met before. Um, my family live in Knowlesley, oh. and they're devastated by the closure of what? Well, we hope it won't. So what's happening? Um. <laughs> 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 well, what's happening is it's, it's, um, we're, not in, in, uh, we're not actually in debt. We're, we're in a situation where it's cash flow, 
and because of just because we're a small charity and a small group of trustees, um, people get worried because <coughs> as a charity you're not allowed to trade with any kind of loss, it's just a fact. So we're in a situation where we're very vulnerable. So if those trustees are jittery, you know, it's, it's, it's in fairness to them, they're personally liable. So you have to, we have to kind of work very hard and hopefully after Christmas there's, you know, people coming to the table who hopefully can help us through this room. It's, you know, um, partners from farther afield, groups, for example, like the Union Project, um, you know, more locally, perhaps the way to our lodges, looking at ways of creatively putting a package together where we can keep going. And that's where we have fingers crossed. But it's a tough time for parks. In Liverpool here, in, in two years' time, we'll probably have a negative have a zero parks budget. And I don't know if that's true where you live, but Mosley also will have no money at all to send in parks. What are we going to do for this? You know, it's, it's ecology in the city and there's, there's no money and there's no priority to give funding. Horticultural skills don't exist. There's a, we've got a wonderful connection with Nantes in France. Um, Liverpool has two um, supervisors responsible for parks. France, a country with a recession, when you think about this in European terms, and what maybe we're losing in terms of those connections, um, not a country in recession has 350 gardens, and they value the culture and art. And, and that city, which was very, it's actually the same size population as Liverpool, is thriving because it's culture, it's art, and it's green space. So go to Nantes if you get a chance. <laughs> <laughs> so, any other questions for any of our speakers? step for them and it's something that we've wanted to do for ages but they have actually got a very good environmental strategy team um, and for us the important thing is to secure that legacy so it doesn't, it doesn't disappear you know, so they're producing for management plans and sheets for their work. Okay, can I just ask Richard another question? <laughs> You're getting a double <laughs> slot <Yeah>. Richard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be talking about perennial meadows um, and um, what we've done How do you manage in, in with perennial meadows? So how do you manage public expectation about appearance of meadows at the end of the season <coughs> and in the winter when either you've left a significant biomass on the surface for all the best by biodiversity reasons overwintering, or you've cut it off and it's still rather brown? And I think you have, you, to, you have to. You have to. Effectively, a lot of these places have to look fairly neat. Yeah. So and I always remember when I first got interested in meadows, which is quite a long time ago, um, trying to find a meadow in July and get it there, and it was too late, and I didn't get it. Yeah. And we forget a lot of these natural meadows are actually managed quite intensively and actually don't really look much different to the ones in the winter, maybe around the edges of things. So there is, um, you know, obviously an expectation that, and I think probably colleges have pushed it a bit too far sometimes, mm -hmm. and that if things look neglectful, um, too long, people yeah. people will won't remember how the flowers are in the summer. Yeah. yeah, and this need to trim the edges, this kind of aesthetic of care to create desire lines or but it but it does change, for example, you know, in, in, in Oxford, in Northern Forage or wherever, they have these magnificent artillery meadows in the prominent courtyards. And people accept, you know, yeah. it's like in Germany and in Berlin and places. It's 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 a different culture. So I think it's over time. You know, it, it can change. It's, yes. it's about education and um, people celebrating the flowers at their best so they don't forget them. And also thinking about things to do in the winter, which remind people projections in the city. Um, we're going to have projections in Liverpool actually close to Chinatown where some of these images will be displayed in the winter. Yes. <coughs> Any more questions? Again, sorry, Richard, it's for you. <laughs> um, which is really interesting because you've attracted so much interest with a fantastic, fantastic talk. Um, I was really interested in your use of the word ecological awakenings. And I wondered, have you tracked people's relationship with nature as you've sparked the interest? Not as much as we should. Um, I mean, we've tried. And, uh, we've tried at different times, actually. We've, we had a thing which we call um, 
eureka moments where we try to get whoever you know to write down what it was that inspired them in nature. So you know, please for people to buy anything. But it, it's it's usually very personal, and we've tried it actually at very academic conferences, and often people are very shy to say what it was that got kicked them off in terms of that connection. Um, but that's why we were so. Robert McFarlane actually was wonderfully generous. He came and gave a talk at the Tate Gallery in Liverpool. And, um, but his, his reaction with the children, particularly, we did a workshop with children, in terms of them thinking of new, maybe Scouse or maybe Mancunian words for um, flowers or the process of cultivation. And they, they were coming up with, um, you know, like all kinds of unusual words like hotspot for dandelion, which, you know, Pergling and, and different things which were about the care and sowing seed or and, and why not? You know, these things, it's this personality with the landscape which I think is really important. And we were getting stories from people who'd lived there a long time. The, the parish priest at the church at the top of the hill in Everton had lived there through all the worst of the kind of demolition um, and had retired and it said that he felt that that happening that summer had kind of was a reflection of his ministry or what he was trying to achieve with his ministry. We think, <laughs> so we get these little snippets, but we don't make them. And it's all out there. So these kind of cultural stories, um, I think this kind of new, I, this idea of what you can make from these connections and people, it just becomes big. You know, I think we've, we've, it's really untapped. I think, in the but I love the walking. I think you know this idea of walking and the pedestrian view in terms of how that links to ecology is, is great, you know, in terms of how we observe the world. You know, I think there's so many exciting things that can come from that. In, in China, the um, current five-year plan has in it the aspiration that China will, will become an eco-civilization. But this idea of an eco-civilization isn't really known in the West. We don't speak of an eco-civilization or an ecological civilization. Ironically, this term comes out of China, who we regard as um, major polluters. Now, next year, in August, there is the, the Intercol Congress. So Intercol is the association of all the ecological societies of the world. And if you guys would like to put together a symposium rather like we're having now. There's still a chance to just go do that. Okay. It'd be a good thing to do. You mm. would get funding from the BES if you're a, if you're a member of the BES and if you're if you're reasonably young. Yeah. <laughs> 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 you would get funding. <laughs> so the professor Bradshaw he was past president of the Ecological Society, Christian Ecological Society. I remember him telling me that when he went to um, He's interested in watching the Xbox illustration. I remember him telling me when he went to China for the first time, which I think was a British ecological expedition in 1986 or something. And um, he realised the Forbidden Palace, the garden created the Forbidden Palace, was created on rubble and waste. So, in a way, it, was, it was, could have been the first derelict land scheme that would have been the garden of the And I think China is probably the place where a lot of these things were. First. Well, especially because they're uh, engineering new new cities, yeah. uh, and so that you have a you have a blank canvas. Okay. Any other questions before we have? We still have time for one or two more before we get back on track. So I've got I've got one for you as well. Then. So do you think you, you touched on it in your talk that there are lots of other ways that Liverpool and Manchester could join in terms of their shared cultural and history backgrounds, so music, football. Um, just being in the northwest and their shared industrial heritage. So, is there something in addition to that that ecology and wildflowers brings to ideas about how you might create communities and sense of identity? I think so. It's like um, in like this place in Highton. This is in Highton. The people, the kids around there, when we walk through once, we call them in Liverpool, Latin, Liverpool, Latin. And it's 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 like the platform really. I mean, in the face of it. It might seem a bit esoteric, but um, it does engage people in the kind of conversation they wouldn't have. We've, you know, we've worked quite a lot of musicians, um, and you just get into different conversations. And so, 
there's, an, there's a remarkable couple of artists called the Sing Twins, I don't know if anyone's ever heard of them, they're from the Wirral. Simon Sharma, when he did his Faces of Britain series, included them. They do they, they these remarkable, um, fine, um, miniature engineering drawings and then make these big canvases. And they did a great artwork about the capital of culture in Liverpool. But they're doing, there's, there's a possibility, because of the links between fabric and, and um, between both cities, that there's going to be this exhibition based around um, art and fabric. And there's this weaving of that and flowers and design. And if you look at any design, you know, how often it's, it's all these natural themes, you know, the golden thread, you know, the Indian sort of, all the Fibonacci stuff, it all weaves into one in terms of the art and stuff. Just becomes very chaotic, but fabulously complicated. Brilliant. Let's give Richard another round of applause for filling up this Brilliant. So back on schedule now with Dawn Scott from the University of Brighton. <coughs> Uh, good afternoon. Um, so um, I get this question quite a lot, how many urban foxes are there? Usually by newspapers, Daily Mail, wanting to have a nice quote uh, so they can all go out and uh, tell people to start fox hunting in cities. Um, but uh, this is a question that has uh, been posed to us by the public and obviously people who are interested. And I'm going to give a little bit of a, a background today about how we've been trying to tackle this question as a team. And sometimes this video, um, I put this in just to show you that sometimes you do get the perception that you are overrun uh, by urban foxes, especially when they're spilling out of, of the den. I need the clicker. Sorry, thank you. It's not coming up on the screen. It's coming up on there, but not on there. We had this problem in another room the other day, and the technician did something magical and it worked. Yeah, great. Or escape or something, and then start. Yeah. Yeah. Tell you what, if I put it, click it onto the second slide. Do you want to go and get the? No, it's fine. Uh, what I'll do is I'll just click it onto the second slide. It might be no. Try F five. It should. Somebody want to <laughs> press escape, get out of the PowerPoint, and then restart it. So Get out of this map. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, this is a really good start, isn't it? it we is. could have done this in the, <laughs> in the 15 minutes. People can just watch the foxes. <laughs> watch the foxes. Just spend the whole time 15 minutes watching yeah. the foxes. Where's the cursor gone? Looks <laughs> <laughs> so the cursor's stuck. So we're officially stuck. The whole thing's crashed because I've got a video. Oh, there we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it. not on the right slide anymore, but hey. Um, Um, can we go? <laughs> uh, right, let's try again. If you restart it, I'll do it on the computer and not the clicker. That yeah, let's work. try that. <laughs> right, Ooh, let's so try again. <laughs> Hey. So, um, so yes, so uh, we're going to try and tackle the um, question of how many foxes are there and are we overrun by foxes? Um, so obviously um, those of you in the room are um, uh, some urban ecologists and we know that urbanisation is one of the greatest uh, forms of major land use change and obviously creates challenges for wildlife and overall uh, a decline in biodiversity but we also know that some species um, that are flexible behaviourally can exploit <coughs> these urban areas and in some cases due to increasing resources and lack of competition they can do actually really well uh, and they can end up in higher numbers than in rural areas. And one of the key examples uh, that seems to be taken over the globe in urban areas is the red fox and because of its opportunistic, flexible uh, behaviour and because of its wide geographic um, spread, including areas where it's been introduced, uh, it has been colonising urban areas across the globe. I have to walk across the screen now, so I shall stay this side. Um, so a little bit of background about urban um, foxes in this country, uh, and I'm going to be focusing on suburban areas, which is their preferred habitat. 
Uh, but we do have some background about how they've changed over time, and this might lead to the perceptions of, of higher densities and change. So foxes have been found uh, in England uh, since the 1930s, since the end of um, the war, and it was noted that they were found in cities. I've not included Scotland in this map. We don't have um, good records for Scotland, but we do know they've been in Glasgow from about around the same time. In 1980s, there was another survey, a national distribution in England, and they found, uh, this is by, um, from Baker and Harris, um, they found that the it wasn't uniform across the country. There seemed to be a latitudinal, longitudinal difference in urban foxes. So in Bristol, London, in the south, uh, there was quite a lot of urban foxes uh, noted to be present. Uh, but in the north, such as some of the cities uh, we've been hearing about in the last talk, there wasn't as many foxes or there wasn't foxes present. Uh, in uh, 2001, there was another survey um, done uh, by Wilkinson and Smith, and they sent questionnaires to councils asking if there had been changes. And yes, it seemed like foxes had changed uh, and were found in more cities. But there wasn't a comprehensive distribution map. So what uh, I was involved with a television programme in 2012 called Foxes Wild in the City, which was Channel 4 and Winfall Films. And as part of this um, show, there was three one-hour live shows and discussions and all sorts of different stuff about urban foxes. Uh, as a scientific advisor, we created a platform that allowed people to submit sightings. So they could go online and they could go do lots of different things, follow foxes and uh, answer questionnaires. But one of the things they could do is they could actually submit if they'd seen a fox uh, in the preceding three months. And uh, this survey was uh, open for two weeks, and in that two weeks we got nearly 6, 000, uh, 16,000 records of foxes across the country with photos on some of them. And this uh, map shows the distribution of foxes across the UK from these reports. If we compare it with the data from the 1987 and 2000 maps that we have, 91% of cities that had no foxes uh, in um, these previous records now had foxes. So foxes are more or less widespread. There are some patches uh, where they may be present, but not, not uh, in, in high numbers, but we do know foxes are more or less resident in, in nearly all cities across um, the UK now. So we know they're widespread. Uh, in 144 cities, we use the number of records um, to be able to come up with what we call sightings density to try and get an index or proxy of uh, the density. Uh, and this is the figure from uh, this paper we've produced. So you can see Newcastle, Leeds, Manchester, Liverpool, cities that didn't have foxes now seem to be having foxes. Uh, and um, we weren't sure whether this gave us any idea of actual true density. So this is fox, fox number of sightings per 1,000 people per <coughs> kilometre. So it really was quite a, a coarse uh, estimate. So are fox populations changing, urban fox populations? Um, in 1990s, there was an estimate of uh, 33,000 um, um, published by Harris. Uh, Stephen Harris, uh, but if you look at the literature and look across uh, is the densities in urban cities, most of the figures are around 2 to 12 kilometres, uh, 2 to 12 uh, adults per kilometre square, uh, and that's outside of the breeding season, so that doesn't include sub-adults and juveniles. But there has been really high densities, such as in Bristol, uh, 37 adults per kilometre squared. That was just before there was an outbreak of mange, which caused um, a 95% crash in the population within a couple of years, and this is in the 1990s. So we know urban fox populations changes, some have increased, some have decreased. Uh, we know there are incidences of mange uh, in higher in some areas than other areas. We know urban areas are changing, landscapes are changing. So we wanted to really find out if we can actually work out the densities. Now why? Why do we need to work out the densities? <laughs> Not just to appease the press, uh, but also they are um, a host of a multiple different uh, zoonotic, possible zoonotic diseases such as Echinococcus and rabies, <coughs> which we don't have uh, currently in this country, but they are a potential. Um, so we need to understand how uh, the, the densities of the host to be able to model and protect against these potential diseases. And the foxes, uh, fox does um, potentially carry uh, several diseases. So to be able to understand densities, we need to understand how uh, a bill about uh, fox ecology. So the first thing we need to know is how many fox families there are. Now, foxes, urban foxes tend to live in ter territorial social groups uh, with very little overlap. So they have territories that seem to be like a bit of a jigsaw puzzle. 
and typically each family group or social group, because some of them are non-related, um, produce one litter a year. This is one family that we studied. This is Stumpy, the female. You can see she's radio collared, and you can see the cubs. There's two litters of cubs, slightly different ages, and this fox family has two females that are feeding the cubs, bringing in food, and we think there's two litters because there's 11 cubs uh, in this family. So uh, a, a social group will produce about one litter a year or maybe a group of litters, uh, so the, the cubs will be uh, brought together. The average group size of the family can vary, but um, uh, when we look at population estimates, 3.4 tends to be used as the number of adults per group. The cubs emerge about May, and then they start to distribute wider and wider. They uh, meet at what we call rendezvous sites, and by July, these rendezvous sites are about 150 metres apart. So we, if we know the size of the territory, and we can count the number of litters, or the number of social groups, uh, then we can work out density, and that's the principle that we went by. So the aim of the study was to try and develop a method to estimate density across different cities, see if there was any change, and then also to see if there were suburban landscape parameters associated with urban densities. So we took, this, took the sightings data that we had from Foxes Live, we chose eight cities from the range of densities from London, which had a highest recording down to Preston, in some cities, such as uh, high city, density, medium and low, we did some replicates. And then in Brighton, where we had uh, home range data, we did more replicates as well. So we ended up with eight cities and 14 sites. Now, we can only survey between July and the August. So it is a very, very short time period to get across this many cities. <coughs> so uh, these are our sites, rand uh, random sites, suburban areas from uh, Brighton one kilometre squared, you can see the overlap with the radio tracking densities there. These are all our uh, foxes that we've radio tracked uh, in Brighton in that figure. In this figure this shows the, um, the jigsaw of the territories, the overlap of the social groups. In this social group we have five adults and this is from trapping, radio tracking and camera trapping. This group we had the three, so sugar and stumpy and, and a male. Um, so we use this to work out uh, an average group size. So in Brighton, we had an average group size of 3.3, which was very similar to what we were using. And using this very sort of coarse estimate, we came up with a density of 23 kilometers, uh, 23 adults per kilometer squared. So between July and August, uh, 2013, 14, and 15, we distributed 30,000 questionnaires across eight cities, 14 replicates, which covered a total area of 17 kilometers squared. In the questionnaire, we asked if they had cubs in their garden. Uh, in this period, overall, we got uh, just under 6,000 returns, uh, including um, nearly 2,000 recordings of cubs. I gave this data to one of my colleagues who's better at GIS than me. <laughs> uh, we plotted the returns, uh, so the respondents are in blue. The yellow uh, is where they reported a cub, and the red is where they reported a den. We used 150 meter intrigate, uh, inter, to integrate the points into uh, social groups so we could work out the number of social groups um, and we then counted how many social groups and how many um, social groups we got from dens or from cub sightings. So we did this for all the different cities. Uh, so here is the cub integration and the densities that we got. So we did Fox social group numbers. Um, and uh, the density from the den integration. But the main point of the data is here. So this is the density estimate for uh, London, for Brighton. You can see Bournemouth is uh, the highest. Uh, but again, this doesn't get anywhere near the 37 uh, that they got from Bristol. So these are what we call medium densities, and it's not doesn't look like L London's overrun by foxes. What's interesting is this group of cities is where they weren't present before 1986. And they also, uh, they're a little bit lower, uh, but it's not statistically significant. Uh, but those numbers are looking similar to the southern cities now. So places um, that we saw on the map are looking like they've got similar densities um, to southern cities. Um, I'll talk through a little bit of this. I know I haven't got much time because we started late. Um, so we looked at landscape parameters and we didn't find any of the landscape parameters, housing density, green space, anything like that affecting densities or, or related to densities. The only thing that we found slightly different is how long they'd been there, so what was the colonisation period. Uh, okay, so <laughs> results. So uh, we now have an estimate of uh, Fox social groups, which is um, 5.29 per kilometre. This is a lot bigger than 1986 estimates. Most of the rabies models deal with Fox social groups of less than uh, 
Uh, uh, they go up to four per kilometre squared, so we need to revisit the rabies mitigation models. Average fox density is now higher than what we either previously had <coughs> estimates of, uh, and it's very similar between cities, and there's, no, there's less significant difference between the north and south. But what we can say is the densities have increased in the last 30 years. They're in more cities, and the densities in the north have actually increased. Densities in the south don't ha um, have not increased, and they are not at high levels. So if we take this and we multiply this density by the suburban land use, we get them up with a new estimate. And I, uh, I put, don't tweet this because I will have the newspapers on me until <laughs> I get it. Um, so five times more foxes than the um, urban population estimate in 1995. Our fox densities have gone up, but that's mainly because there's more cities with foxes and those with foxes have increased. Total suburban population has increased, uh, but I wanted to put that into context. So on average, we, for every fox, there is 130 houses or over 300 people. So this number might sound really big, but actually, you know, 300 people for every fox uh, is not that much, I don't think. Um, and we think there's other factors affecting the density that we have to look into, probably likely to be disease, but also we know that feeding behavior for, um, uh, affects their ranges, which can affect density. And in some of the national surveys, we've been looking at um, nearly 36% of people said they feed foxes. So there's a lot of food going into the environment. It's affecting their behavior and it could be affecting their density. So, sorry, I've really rushed through that. Um, so thank you to everyone who helped collect the data and any questions. Oh, no. I think we've not got time. Uh, thank you ever so much for um, getting through everything. Um, we to stay on track, we'll not have any questions now. But if you've got any questions about that for Dawn, then I'm sure she'll be around at the end and you can catch up with her then. Thank you. No, that's all right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like me to make attention again? Someone talk at the back. I think it's fine. Um, minute, let's it didn't work at first. Does this work? Really it, it, it has wasn't been working. working. Yeah, it wasn't working the last thing, but okay. is it that one? Let's, let's see if it works again. Is, that, is, it, is it the middle one? It should be that. No, this, the, there's, no, there's been no studies. Oh, yeah. So is it... Is it, is it I'll, which I'll one? Which one? Yeah. And there were studies done on diet. So that one. That one, yeah. About 30 years ago, before taking natural food, I think they switched. Okay, so we'll now move on to... Helen, start her presentation. Thank you, Martin. Okay, um, thank you, everyone. I'm going to look at um, the opportunities and challenges of introducing perennial um, urban meadows from the perspective of local authority um, stakeholders who were involved um, in a co-produced meadows experiment. And this was part of the Urban Best project, um, which Bryony um, talked about earlier, um, which involved these different universities and sponsored by NERC. Um, I think many of us here now know what um, some of the global challenges are. We've got increasing global population, increasing urban population, putting pressure on ecosystem services. And um, more and more nature-based solutions, such as introducing um, meadows, um, are being advocated um, as a way to manage urban green infrastructure, because not only are they inspired and supported by nature, they can actually build resilience back into the system. Um, there is a growing evidence base for the benefits of these approaches. Um, the first, looking particularly, specifically at urban meadows, um, the first piece of research was actually done as part of our um, BEST project, um, where um, we showed that these meadows increase um, the human aesthetic value of these spaces, people enjoy the spaces more, um, and they perceive the quality of the sites um, as improving. And this is work um, from the urban pollinators um, work that's been going on, showing that um, for invertebrates, um, these um, plantings, well, they're not plantings, they're sowings, have um, considerable benefits. However, um, there doesn't seem to be much research which actually looks at how the people who are actually implementing this stuff on the ground um, perceive um, what, you know, perceive what are the challenges, what, what opportunities are there to do this. So um, the Urban Best Meadow experiment um, was co-produced with Luton and Bedford Borough Councils in real world urban spaces. Um, in terms of our um, scientific objectives, um, 
We were looking particularly at resident um, reactions to these introduced meadows. We were looking, or Bryony particularly, was looking at invertebrate response, and we were looking at changes in water infiltration and soil carbon. The local authority managers, as you can imagine, particularly if you heard what Richard was saying, um, are um, threatened with these drastic budget cuts, and they were interested in cost effectiveness. So um, we introduced nine different meadow mixes to different sites in Bedford and Luton. And these were defined by the floristic diversity or species diversity and the height. So we had three which were entirely grass, um, three which were, had a high forb seed content, um, and three which were moderately flowery. And then the heights were actually achieved through different mowing regimes were cut at a different frequency. Um, and these were all native perennial meadows. We introduced these in a variety of sites um, throughout Bedford and Luton because we wanted to understand better, and the local authorities did, um, the role of spatial context, um, particularly in relation to people's houses. And they were introduced in these rather um, rigid, um, unimaginative uh, rectangular blocks, but um, this is the kind of compromise. This was a scientific experiment, um, and so we wanted to be able to compare the treatments. Now, from the perspective of this particular piece of research that I'm reporting on was a qualitative part of the, part of the um, overall um, Urban Best Meadows experiment where we were looking at these stakeholder perspectives. For this, we had two research questions. We were asking, what are the factors which managers who are doing this themselves perceive as key um, uh, and define the opportunities and challenges of, of doing this? And then, um, does the, the perception of these factors vary between people in different managerial roles in local authorities um, and also depending on their underlying values? So um, the first, um, looking at the methodology, um, I've been working in this kind of key bridging role between um, academics in Sheffield, um, Crownfield and Exeter and the local authorities and I had volumes of field notebooks and emails um, which charted the project the Meadows experiment history from December 2012 when it was first mooted. And um, I went through those um, in a process of qualitative content analysis and I identified 11 themes which um, seemed to be significant in terms of, of impacting on, on, on these opportunities and barriers. Um, and used those to create an interview guide and then conducted these semi-structured interviews with all the managers that we'd been involved with. Um, and started with very open questions, asking them to take themselves back to the beginning of their involvement and chart um, what they saw as the high and low points. And that meant that they personally were emphasising what was significant for them rather than me imposing. Um, and then we would use the interview guide as a kind of to flag up anything that wasn't initially um, broached. So um, analysis of the transcripts um, revealed seven key factors. The first one, maybe unsurprisingly, Managers were um, very concerned about um, what these meadows would look like um, and public reaction, the people who lived in these areas and, and used the sites. And in terms of overall reaction to meadows, um, some managers had expected um, people to react um, in a mixed way. Some people would like them, some people wouldn't. Others thought that initially this kind of um, maybe people were used to that nice flat um, mown surface that Richard showed as part of his presentation would react negatively um, and they wouldn't like them. In terms of the individual mixers, managers did think that people would like the more floral mixes. I mean, you might expect that. Um, this is just one um, view that people like to see colour. Um, the landscape architects, I'm actually a landscape architect, um, are interested in all the arty farty stuff, but you know, people don't care about that. And they're not really looking at the biodiversity, the botanical. Um, aspect, they like to see something that's colourful and pretty. Another manager, and this is interesting because of having those of you who listen to Richard, another manager um, had expected a more positive reaction to our meadows because um, she was aware that they'd already introduced some meadows themselves before our experiment on roundabouts that were annual meadows and they'd had people phoning in and normally they didn't get any phone calls apart from complaints. So they, she felt that there is a changing um, public reaction and that people are being positive. In fact, when we did our 
um, quantitative work on site with users, it was this mix, the medium height, highly floral mix, that was the most popular for the public. Um, this manager said she thought that people who were less familiar with wild environments, were less environmentally aware, would gravitate more towards this. Um, the same view, in fact, that Richard put forward earlier, that's the starting point, and then maybe moving people towards understanding and the um, perennial mixes with native species. The next factor was spatial context. Um, we placed those meadows in different places to better understand that. Now, these two sites, these were two of the sites. Um, here, we can see this one is very near housing. This one, the site is um, behind the housing, um, we had very different reactions. Um, it wasn't <coughs> because the, maybe the general reaction was reasonably positive, but you have one or two vocal individuals who don't like meadows, and that can trigger a negative reaction. So stakeholder managers were still really of the view that we can't put them that near the housing. Next point, um, the next factor was the economic sustainability. Managers wanted to save costs, they were aware that cutting meadows less frequently during the season, because they were uh, compared to amenity mown grass, was saving them money. But they did have the perception that getting rid of that large biomass at the end of the year, when you had to do a hay cut, was very expensive. And they didn't see, as yet, um, a solution to that. So you know, it's still going to cost them a lot of money. Um, local politics was a very important factor. The individuals who were vocally negative about that put pressure on local councillors, local elections were coming up, so they put pressure on the parks department. And we actually had to take that site out of our project. and We had to grass it over because the objections were so vocal. You see there is a very narrow area between housing. The next thing, communication, which seems to be highly important within the council, breakdowns in communication can create problems in terms of the maintenance. Um, there was a need to communicate to the public, we found, what was going on on these sites. And we installed this signage on the sites, which explained what was going on in the winter, you know, when they looked brown, explaining they weren't um, necessarily supposed to look pretty all year. Um, man many managers um, were also aware of the importance of increasing biodiversity in urban areas. They were aware of the diminishing biodiversity and the fact that these meadows could contribute. The final factor was the physical um, factor, the, the effect of the soil, the climate, <coughs> which interestingly came out as less important than any of the others in terms of the manager perceptions. Then, um, looking at relative importance of the factors um, and um, between individual managers, you can see here that those first three, aesthetics, spatial context, and the economics, were seen by all the eight managers as being highly important factors um, impacting on future feasibility of future management. However, um, you can see then things begin to change because the strategic managers, which with more links externally, are aware more of the politics, whereas people who are involved in operations, hardly surprisingly, are more aware of physical things. We also found um, uh, that the ecological managers had very strong managers who were, um, had some background in uh, wildlife um, and biodiversity, had strong biocentric views um, and values. And they were also aware that their values were very different to members of the public. Um, and these people um, really did support future meadow introduction and they were very engaged in terms of suggesting ways in which we might, for example, um, introduce anaerobic digesters to deal with that problem of the large biomass um, of the meadow um, cuttings. Um, so in conclusion, we have these three dominant factors, the aesthetics and public reactions, spatial context and the economics. Um, the manager role and their values did affect the emphasis they placed on the different factors. But interestingly, we were, the managers were aware of these changing public value orientations and acceptance of a messier urban aesthetic not all tri trimmed and tidy all the time in every place. And that, yes, meadows are perceived as a possible management alternative to this mown grass, as long as you do think about where you put them a little bit. Well, not a little bit, probably a lot. <laughs> and also <laughs> consult with local people and politicians. So we also worked with our 
partners in Luton and Bedford to write this um, policy and practice note, which is available um, downstairs at the best stand. Um, and it's also available, um, just Google, uh, living with environmental change, um, policy and practice note. And it, it also addresses some of the issues like what is a meadow? Because perceptions of meadows have changed. People have seen more annual meadows, bright, non-native species, and that's what they think is a meadow. So if they see something which is perennial and less colourful, they might not accept it. Um, the, or or they might, there might be a different, it might be opposite, depending on previous life experience. So clearly I'd like to thank everyone involved in the Urban Deaths project at um, Exeter, Cranfield, and particularly Sheffield that headed this up. Um, and particularly the, the stakeholder partners who were interviewed um, and yes this was part of the, the larger best project so thank you very much <laughs>
And obviously I'm at the end of an urban ecology session, so I don't need to go into a lot of detail, but what I did want to highlight was that in the UK we have a massive urban land resource, so there's more than 20,000 square kilometres of urban land, and about 50% of that probably in the UK is green space. And we have quite good knowledge now about, you know, and there's really a lot of exciting work going on about ecosystem service provision within our urban green spaces, and we're starting to demonstrate how they're important they are in terms of, you know, sort of the regulating services and particularly the cultural services that people get from the green spaces. But what we don't have as, as, as good a data about is actually how these support green spaces in urban areas can actually support provisioning services. And the two services that I'm going to talk about today, particularly, are own grown food production and short rotation coppice biofuel production. And the reason that I'm going to focus on these two um, services. And firstly, own growing has been recognised and is widely talked about by policy makers and scientists and within the media as key to local food security, healthy diets and well-being. But there really isn't a lot of data to support these kind of statements that, are, that go on. Um, in addition to that, in terms of biofuel production, the UK government targets require that 15% of all our energy production should come from renewable sources. And short rotation coppice biofuel production has been identified as key to as a key supplier, as a key source of that renewable energy. Uh, but natural England and DEFRA guidelines focused almost exclusively on the use of agricultural lands, so then you get a, a food fuel conflict going on. And so at the moment there haven't really been any systematic assessments of how um, urban green space could actually contribute to food or biofuel production at a citywide or at a national scale. So the key research questions we're going to talk about today are firstly, how does own grown food production in allotments, and I'm focusing exclusively here on allotments because they're the kind of main areas of food production, the large areas of food production in our cities and towns, so how do they contribute to food security at a citywide scale? And then also, how much urban green space is actually suitable um, for short rotation coppice biofuel production at a citywide scale? So I'm going to be using the city of Leicester as my case study area. So it's, it's just over 70 square kilometres and it's 56% it's green space. 18% of that is, a domestic, is domestic gardens and 39% of that land is non-domestic green space. Allotments are a really small component of that green space. They're less than 1.5%. But in terms of provision nationally, Leicester's really up there as one of the top... Um, as one of the top sort of providers per head of population for allotments in the UK. So the first bit of work I'm going to talk to you about was actually uh, done by Nicola McHugh with me, um, and it's looking at short rotation coppice biofuel production within the city. She used the GIS modelling approach and applied the spatial restriction criteria of the UK energy crop scheme guidance um, to the urban green space within Leicester, um, and then estimated short rotation coppice yields from published data. And what we found was that actually, although generally urban green space is assumed really not that suitable for short rotation coppice, 8% of the city actually fit that restriction criteria. And that, to put into context, could supply energy to more than 1,500 homes or 30 municipal buildings. So that just... Uh, the dark green areas are the patches that are suitable. So the, green, the, the pale green is just normal green space. Um, so things like got, uh, large parks and um, golf courses were excluded. Um, the dark green areas are actually the short rotation coppice suitable areas. So then moving on, um, I looked at potential uh, at, at food production at a citywide scale currently um, within allotments. Um, first of all, I needed to collect, I, I wanted to scale up and estimate what was being produced. So I needed yield data. So I ran a citizen science project called Measure Your Harvest, which I've actually got funding to run next year. So if anyone's an own grower, um, I hopefully it, uh, there'll be a website available fairly soon for people to submit data to. to. So I collected yield data, so kilograms per square metre of typical staple, staple UK fruit and vegetable crops. And then I also worked um, with Leicester City Council and went into um, 16 allotment sites and took detailed plot maps of what people were actually growing in the summer at peak production. We also surveyed the uh, allotments at a citywide scale using Google Earth to look at levels of cultivation and plot usage. So 
there's 97 hectares of land uh, assigned to allotments in Leicester. Um, and at the time of the survey, 13% of the allotment plots were completely unused. So um, they were completely uncultivated. And a further 18% of allotment land of that 97 hectares was used for other features on allotments, so uh, society huts and roads. So quite unsurprisingly, really, what we found was that nearly 20% of all cultivation was for spuds. Uh, these are the top 25. There were about 70 different crops grown in this plots um, surveyed, 64 plots surveyed, but you know, what people grew in Leicester seemed to be typical, you know. Spuds, onions, strawberries, beans. Uh, yeah. And then this is, this is my harvest yield. So what we, the, the, the red line across the middle is uh, the UK cereal crop yield. Uh, it, it would be too complicated to show here the different horticultural equivalents to yield that people were getting. But what, what was clear from the my harvest yields was that people were achieving a similar yield, if not more, to what hort commercial horticulture were, were achieving. So anyway, those data enabled us to get a first estimate of what's being grown um, at a citywide scale in allotments. Um, and there's more than 1,500 tonnes of fruit, fruit and veg produced um, and, and potatoes produced <coughs> at current levels of cultivation. And that could be increased if, if the extra 13% of, uh, of the city's allotments were used, uh, another 250 tonnes could be produced. But those figures aren't that meaningful. So wh what's more informative is if you convert it to your five-a-day diet. So that's 400 grams of fresh fruit and veg per person per day. We split here. The green bars are the fruit and veg. Potatoes are brown. So on average in the UK, we eat 37 kilograms each of potatoes per year. <laughs> So, um, at current levels of cultivation on the plots, they were feeding more than 8,500 people on their five-a-day diet. If they were fully cultivated, that's an extra 1,000 people added on to being fed. So just to put that into further context, the allotments cover less than 1.5% of the city, but they, they are feeding presently more than 3% of the population, or about 3% of the population on their five-a-day diet. But the spatial restriction criteria that you apply uh, for short rotation coppice production in areas um, of other green space, so I should have said the, um, ex excluded from this uh, suitability for short rotation coppice was allotment land. So that extra 8% assi assigned um, that, that could be used for short rotation coppice could actually, um, using the data that we got from the measurements um, on allotments, feed 18% of the city on their five-day diet. So it really shows that there is potential to make a big contribution um, to local food security. But underpinning production uh, within a city is the soil quality. And we've done work in the past that's really demonstrated that urban soils are of really good quality in terms of organic matter. Um, so this graph just demonstrates here the green bar, I don't know whether you can see the X and Y axis. The green bar is urban allotment soil carbon storage. The brown are agricultural soil carbon storage. And this soil carbon is a really good indicator of overall soil quality. It's linked positively with ecosystem service provision and also with yields. So what this demonstrates is that they really are potentially quite suitable for food production or for biofuel production. Oh. But a complicating factor in an urban area is proximity to industry, roads, domestic heating. Um, and so really there is potentially a risk to human health associated with own growing, particularly associated with heavy metals. They're emitted as a particulate and deposited onto the soil. And current um, contaminated, or contaminated land exposure models provide soil guideline values based on concentrations of heavy metal present within the soil. Emitted with heavy metals is black carbon. Um, now, that's interesting for two reasons. Firstly, it's, it's a particulate that's um, the product of the incomplete combustion of fossil fuels and biomass, and it's a very stable store of carbon in the soil, but it's also been very strongly linked to um, reducing the bioavailability of heavy metals to food crops. So I'm really interested in it for that reason. Um, 
And at this point, I really hope to have some data to show you um, uh, the relationship between heavy metals and black carbon in urban soils in Leicester, but I don't have that data yet, so hopefully next year. <laughs> but what I can show you is that urban soils do contain really large amounts of black carbon. So the, the green bar here is soil organic carbon, and the grey bar on top is black carbon. This is in the northeast of England, not in Leicester. But I'd expect that there's a fairly strong relationship between heavy metal concentration and black carbon. And what I really want to know is how black carbon affects the bioavailability of heavy metals to own-grown food crops. And so that brings me on to a national project that I've started now, um, which is going to combine GIS data, field soil sampling, lab analysis and bioassays. So I'll be looking at the range of heavy metals present in um, urban soils across the UK uh, and the relationship with black carbon and then run bioassays with typical staple UK fruit and vegetable crops to look at the effect of black carbon concentration in soil and heavy metal uptake. I'll also, as I said earlier, be running the citizen science um, project over the 2017 growing season collecting data on own growing from people across the UK. So if anyone does own grow, <laughs> it would be great if you wanted to participate. And what the key research questions that I'm aiming to I, I answer within this project over the next few years is how does own growing contribute to food security nationally in the UK and is there potential to increase that? What's the potential for short rotation coppice biofuel production at a national scale in UK urban green space? How do heavy metals in urban soil limit the amount of land that is actually available for food production and could that land then be suitable for biofuel, produ biofuel production if unsuitable for sh um, food production? And how can urban food and fuel production relieve pressure on high quality agricultural land, for, particularly for cereal crop production? And so really just to conclude, what, what we, I think this work's demonstrated is that at a city-wide scale, own grown food production and biofuel production could make quite a a big contribution to local sustainability and resilience, um, make uh, to food and energy security. But really, the urban soil properties are what are what underpin the ability of these green spaces to support the services. And so, that's why all this research that I'm planning and I'm, I'm doing at the moment into heavy metal quality, heavy metal and black carbon is really important. And looking at this at a national scale will hopefully give us a picture of how important our green spaces are across the UK. And yeah, these are the people I'd like to acknowledge. So it's funded by UPSRC. Thank you. So, have got any questions for Jill? Oh, lots of questions and stuff. Mm -hmm. Hi, Jill. Oh, yeah. Hi, Jill. Thanks so much. Fascinating. Um, I have a question about trade offs. Yeah. So, if land's converted from coppicing or what's called unproductive development land is growing for crops, what are we losing? So. What, what areas are they compensating going into? And because um, unmanaged allotment plots might not be good for food grain, but it might be good for biodiversity. Yeah, so yeah. Is that something that, that it, it's something that I, I'd like to do as a paper based exercise, but isn't part of the research in this, because obviously there are going to be massive trade offs, particularly putting in, you know, with an allotment, they're often quite, you know, patches of land that not everyone has access to, for example, not like a recreational park and short rotation coppice are not necessarily the most beautiful um, you know beautiful patches of land but managed right could look quite nice in an urban green space but yeah the, the we're not I'm not looking at that as part of the project rather than a sort of trade off assessment towards the end maybe. Um, two basic questions really. Why are there um, There is appetite. So, so national the the, the, uh, the allotment waiting lists have increased year on year. Uh, so there's something like 90, 90 odd thousand people on a waiting list for allotment. I think there's a there's a bit of double counting in that. You know, there's people on multiple waiting lists. But and there is appetite. But one of the things that I think we need to look at, and, and I will be able to look at with the data set that we get hopefully, is hot spots of provision and low you know areas of low provision, and that's something that's quite important. Also 
if you're going to increase own growing space, you need to increase it where it's, where it's demand. So that really needs to be coupled to the waiting lists and things like that. So we, I'm working with a lot of local authorities and getting all of that kind of data together as well as part of this research. Um, how much short rotation compass is grown at the moment? And is there the infrastructure to, to distribute it and to use it as an energy source for these cities? Yeah, grown within urban areas? Yeah. No, not very much, to my knowledge. That you know, As I said, the, the, the guidance focuses almost exclusively on non-urban sites. And no, I don't think the infrastructure is there to a certain extent, but also it, by producing the short rotation compass within an urban area, producing it close to the demand for that fuel. So I think what this project really aims to do is, is the first step at looking for potential production and what could be produced. But I think it might demonstrate that these schemes could become more economically viable because you're producing close to the source for demand. Cool. <laughs> it's time. Well, it's only, uh, only the post session. Um, <laughs> if Biofuels are grown on heavy metal contaminated soils, presumably short rotation compass can also take up heavy metals. Yep, yeah, yeah, it can. End up and fuel the use. So I think uh, you can use special filters when you use that, that short rotation compass. So one of the interesting, one of the things that I think is quite interesting is there, there could be potential to use short rotation compass almost to remediate land to make it then, via, you know, over the course of a 30-year cycle of short rotation compass, to then make it potentially viable for food production further down the line. So, yeah. Okay, brilliant. So, um, give you another round of applause. <laughs> and thank you to all of our fabulous speakers in today's session, and, and thank you for your patience with putting up with missing speakers and technical problems and everything else that's gone on. <laughs> How are you, Martin? I'm okay. You? Yeah, I'm all right. Pretty knackered. Yeah. 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 Sounds like an exciting project, though. Yeah, should be. If I don't fail epically at it. Why would you fail epically? I don't know. So you're kind of rolling that kind of stuff out nationally? Is that the idea? Yeah, basically. So I, I kind of hope to have some of the soil data to yeah. show here as well, yeah. based on the rest of so all the massive yeah. archive soils we've got. But yeah, that's the plan. So I've got a five-year fellowship. <laughs> Yeah. Pretty good though. So yeah, basically, yeah, yeah, probably a massive error actually. Right. Well, I, you know, I don't think anyone views me as any different to a postdoc. Basically. It's your own money, this thing. Oh yeah, it's a, it's a five year, but I've got a postdoc on it in all kinds of ways. Yeah, so it's, it's quite nice. Yeah, it's quite exciting. But I think I just need some time. I basically came back on maternity leave yeah. and started this straight away. And just just a bit smashed it. And how far into it are you now? Yeah. 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 Five years, it's still it's really good. Yeah, it'll be nice. Yeah, hopefully I'll manage to do it. Will they give you a pocket yeah. dollar at the end of it? I don't know. I, I think it's a, I'll have to just make it. Yeah, so I don't know.